Hello everyone, welcome to this lesson. So in this lesson, we're going to continue our discussion on ordinary differential equations, right? In the first lesson, we introduced the Euler method. And in the second method, we introduced improvements on Euler's method in terms of the Hans method, the midpoint method, and the Ralston method. So kind of recap, what does it mean to solve an ordinary differential equation? Well, sometimes we only know how a function is changing, but not necessarily we know the function. So if I have the derivative of a function, and I have an initial condition, I can trace out the trajectory of that function. Those are the only two pieces of information that I know or that I actually need. So um, in this lesson, we're going to introduce a class of equations called the Runge-Kuda methods, which are actually the four techniques that we dealt with before. The Euler method, the Hans, the midpoint, and the Ralston are actually Runge-Kuda methods. And we're going to introduce another Runge-Kuda method, which is a fourth order Runge-Kuda. Now, I want to go through the distinction of a fourth order and a second order and a first order because when we dealt with the Euler method, that was actually a first order Runge-Kuda method. And it went as this, yi plus one is equal to yi plus k1h. So this is the general form of a fourth order, or sorry, a first order Runge-Kuda method, where you can actually predict that the k1 is going to be the derivative at the starting point. So this is the Euler method. The Euler method is a first order Runge-Kuda, and the reason it's called a fir the first order because it uses one derivative, right, in its approximation, the derivative of the uh, starting point. Now, with a second order Runge-Kuda, it takes actually this form, yi plus 1 is equal to yi plus a1k1 plus a2k2 multiplied by h, where k1 is the derivative at the starting point and k2 is the derivative at another point, right? So it's going to take the form of f of uh, xi plus p1h, uh, uh, and the y point is going to be yi plus uh, q11k1h. So let's actually, this is the general form of the second order run. So let's see, actually, let's see this general form when it's specific to Hans method. So we know Hans method is basically taking the derivative at the starting point, the derivative at the end point and getting an average of them. So you can see that a1 and a2 in this case is going to be one half. And you can also predict that k1 is going to be the derivative at the starting point. So k1 is equal to f of x i y i, where f is the derivative function. And k1 is going to be f of xi plus uh, h. So this is the x point for the uh, point at the end of the interval. And also you can see yi plus k1h. So we this embeds Euler's method to get the y. So, so you can see k1 is the derivative at the end point. And, um, sorry, k2 is the derivative at the end point, And k1 is the derivative at the starting point. So actually let's reduce also this general function to the midpoint method. Well, for the midpoint method, uh, a1 is 0, so this term is dropped, and a2 is 1, so we end up with yi plus 1 is equal to yi plus k2h. Now, the reason we have k1 here, because k1, the derivative of the starting point, is used in the calculation of k2. So the k2 is the derivative at the midpoint, which is f of xi plus h divided by 2. So this is the x coordinate of the midpoint. And this is uh, the y, which is yi plus k1h divided by 2. And you can see this is Euler method to get an approximation of what is the midpoint for the y. So actually, let's finally uh, see what, how the general second order range reduces to the Ralston. So we remember the Ralston takes two derivatives into uh, consideration. We have the derivative at the starting point and the derivative at the three quarters of the interval. And it gives a weight of one third to the starting point and uh, two thirds to the point at the three quarters. So you can find that uh, k1 here is defined at the derivative at the starting point, and k2 is uh, f of xi plus 3h divided by 4. That's the coordinate of the 3 fourths point. And you can see that this is yi plus k1 3h divided by 4. So this is Euler basically getting an approximation of what that y would be. So now we have the first order arranged, the Euler, again, the reason it's first order because it only uses one derivative in its approximation. And you can see that second order range uses two 
basically K1 and K2. And you might be thinking the midpoint only has K2, true, but also the K2 is embedded in it K1. So the midpoint requires still two derivative approximations, right? Um, or two derivative calculations to get what that yi plus one is. So actually, let's go to one of the most common uh, uh, Runge CUDA methods actually use, which is the fourth order Runge CUDA. Well, if the order tells us an idea of how many derivatives are used, you can actually see that the fourth order Runge is going to require four derivatives in its um, approximation, k1, k2, k3, and k4. And you can see k1 and k4 have a weight of 1 sixth, and k2 and k3 have a weight of 1 third. Okay, so if 1 sixth taken as a common factor, we have that, um, that form down here. So actually, let's go into a little bit detail what is the definition of k1, k2, k3, and k4. Well, k1 is still the same, so k1 is the derivative at the starting point. Now, k2 is the derivative at the midpoint. So you're going to find that k2 is f of xi plus h divided by 2, and this is Euler, right? Uh, yi plus k1 h divided by 2. Right, so we got the derivative at the midpoint, but here's where where things get a little a uh, little bit interesting, is that k three is the more accurate approximation of the derivative at the midpoint, and the way that happens, is that it's going to be f of x i plus h divided by two. Again, that's the coordinate of the x, and here is where the y is. So it gets a more accurate y using the k two using the previously calculated derivative of the midpoint. So this is how it gets a more accurate um, approximation for the derivative at the midpoint. And given I have this more accurate approximation of the derivative, I can use that to get k4, which is the derivative at the end point of the interval. So now I have 4. k1 is the derivative at the start of the interval. k2 is the first approximation for the derivative at the midpoint, and k3 is the second better approximation for the derivative at the midpoint, and k4 is the derivative at the endpoint uh, of the interval. Okay, so in this lesson, we can actually uh, apply this to this differential equation, x to the square root of y, and we can see that is defined not only in the dependent variable, but also in the independent variable. And the initial condition is y of 2 is equal to 4, and this is the exact solution that we're trying to trace out. So I went ahead and drew it so that we're going to see how close can we get to this kind of trajectory. So that's before we actually go into the, the thing that we um, introduce uh, new here, which is the fourth order, let's actually do the um, uh, the Euler method, the Hans midpoint and Ralston, and see how they're going to approximate this and how the uh, fourth order uh, range compares to those. So I have the code here. The only difference that I did is basically I... Um, coded this new differential equation up here. The entire code is still the same. I just changed um, the independent variable from uh, time to x in, in this example. So I'm going to go ahead. Everything is still the same uh, in terms of the Euler. So I'm going to go ahead and run the Euler to see how it's going to do. All right, great. Uh, so let's actually go ahead and do the um, the errors so we can see how it actually performs. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to also lock it so it doesn't change. I'm going to say minus this is the uh, approximation which I have here. Um, I'm going to do this to be 20. Um, then I'm going to divide this by uh, this and of course I'm going to lock it as well. And the reason I'm locking it because I'm going to be using autofill in, the, in just a second. So I have 21%. So if I drag this like that, all right, so those are 100% because those are empty. So, okay, so I have 21% error for uh, y at seven. Okay, so not too bad. Uh, it's actually a lot better than when I dealt with this function. So you can see actually the function um, is, the error is very dependent on the function that you're, um, that you're dealing with. And also, uh, which a technique performs better also depends on the function and we're going to see in, in just a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and uncomment the Hans and I'm going to uh, see how this performs. All right, excellent. That's 
actually went down to 1.15% error. And you can see this is Hansen's the gray is almost superimposed on the true one, like very, very little error, you know? So let's actually go ahead and see how the midpoint would um, perform with this function. So if I do that, all right, 1.37%, so in the range of the hunt, so around that range. So you can see here, this is the orange almost superimposed on the uh, true function that we have. So let's actually see the last one. Um, I'll actually change this to a T. Um, so actually, let's see if I enact the uh, Ralston method. All right, 1.27%. So you can see that the Hans midpoint and Ralston, all second order run CUDA methods, uh, kind of hover around the um, 1%, one, uh, or between the 1% to 1.5%. And I wanted to see something. Now, the Hans here is the more, most superior in terms of the midpoint and the Ralston. So we have the Hans, um, then the Ralston, then the midpoint. And here... Let's actually see, we see that the Hans actually is the one that performed the worst in terms of this function. The one that performed the best was the Ralston. So you can see all of them kind of hover around the same percentage. This one hovered around between um, kind of maybe uh, around 7.5 to 8. This is where they hovered. And here they hover kind of between 1 and 1.5. So you can see they hover around the same error, but uh, depending on the function uh, will depend on which one will be uh, more superior. So let's actually go ahead into the one that we introduced uh, that is actually most commonly used. And you can see um, this is Euler is a first order runge. And when we went to a second order runge CUDA, we um, improved it much, much better. Now imagine going from a second order to a four, fourth order. So how much improvement are we, are we, are we making? So coding the runge CUDA is actually very, very simple, very similar to uh, what we did in the other ones. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the Euler. Uh, so I already have K1, right? Because I'm just going to evaluate this function at my initial condition. So I already have K1. I'm going to use K1 to get um, uh, an approximation for the Y at the midpoint. Then I'm going to get the Y at the midpoint to get K2. But then I'm going to use K2 to get a better approximation for the Y at the midpoint. So I can get a better approximation for the derivative, which is going to be K3. And then I'm going to use K3 to get um, the approximation for the Y at the end point, and then use the Y at the end point to get what is the derivative at the end point. So given I have K1, K2, K3, and K4, and now I can actually calculate the slope. And the slope is given basically 1 sixth um, for all of them. Uh, it's going to be K1 plus 2 times K2 plus 2 times K3 plus K4. So I... Um, calculated now my new slope and this is a um, identical code for the others uh, so I already um, related it to this column so I'm gonna run the code and see how it's gonna perform well excellent 0 0.01 percent so actually let's see if it's actually less than that actually it's 0 0.005 percent so you can see the massive improvement uh, when I actually do the fourth order runge CUDA and you can see this is green it's almost superimposed on the uh, true value. This is such a low error that this trajectory that I created is almost as good as the true function. So you can see how powerful these techniques are. Only knowing the derivative and only, only knowing the initial condition, and I know nothing about the function, I still created a curve that fits it perfectly. Okay, so um, there's one thing I want you to notice is that what we did in this lesson, we actually did before. I remember a part in um, the lessons where you were trying to get a future function value knowing an initial function value uh, yi. Uh, does f of xi plus 1 equal f of xi plus so on make um, ring a bell? It's the Taylor series. Now, the Runge CUDA is actually superior to the Taylor series for one thing, because the Taylor series, when we're trying to uh, make a Taylor series more accurate, we would add higher order terms. But when we added higher order terms, we still had to uh, add higher order derivatives. So we needed to know the second, the third, the fourth derivative. But in this case, we went to higher orders of Runge CUDA 
only knowing the first derivative, only um, using different approximations of the first derivative. So this is what makes the Runge Kuda, Runge -Kuda um, very powerful, that I only need to know the first derivative as opposed with the Taylor series. If I want more accurate approximations of the Taylor series, I need to be able to calculate higher order derivatives. So to kind of recap what we did in this lesson, one of the big thing is basically we took all the equations that we dealt with or all the methods that we dealt with and we put it under a big umbrella called the runge kuda methods. And uh, we said that the Euler is the first order uh, runge kuda and that's why it deals with uh, one derivative in its approximation. And the Hans midpoint and Ralston are second order runge kuda because uh, in their approximation, they use two approximation for the first derivative and a fourth order. Of course, with that logic, it uh, um, encompasses four approximation approximations for the um, uh, first order derivative value. Well, this really marks the end of this lesson, and I will see you in the next lesson.